Hi, welcome to Human Stories. My name is Agnes Mondragon, and I'm a PhD candidate in the Department of Anthropology at the University of Chicago. Today, I'm gonna to talk about Mexico's so-called war on drug trafficking, which began in 2006 with the deployment of the military to combat drug trafficking organizations throughout the national territory. This confrontation has resulted in a stark increase in homicides, disappearances, forced displacement, and other forms of violence claiming at least a quarter million lives. This violence has been at the center of Mexico's public sphere ever since, while the forms of engaging and making sense of it have transformed in time. So the drug war is defined by opacity since it is impossible to know the whole patterns of confrontation or collusion between organized crime and the state or the logics and victims of their violence. Against this backdrop, mass mediated objects and the logics of their production and circulation are a window into the processes through which the drug war is understood. My research focuses on two key dimensions of the mass mediation of the war. One is the outlining of its protagonists, which are the state and drug trafficking or organized crime. And the other one consists of the patterns of circulation within this media ecology and their consequences. The figures of the state and criminality in the war are shaped by two main conceptual elements. One is the sheer degree of violence produced by the deployment of the military force. This deployment has not only exacerbated the confrontation between criminal organizations, Contrary to its intended goals, it has also shown that the state is exerting extrajudicial violence against its own citizens. The other element is the role of history, which is marked first by events of repression and extrajudicial practices of violence, which have cultivated over the years a generalized distrust towards the state. And second, by the mediatized figure of the drug trafficker as a romanticized image that draws on the revolutionary hero, the generous bandit and the gangster, and which has proven to be broadly appealing. This image circulates widely in a vast cultural production that has long celebrated the drug trade, its hypermasculinity, wealth and excessive consumption, social mobility and transgression. This image, of course, is in tension with the embodied experience of the war, which is one of grief, fear, and indignation, but it still has important effects. So the arc of my dissertation traces how official media forms and narratives are crafted and circulate in the public sphere, and how they are taken up and challenged by other media forms and the widespread perceptions they embody. I then analyze how depictions of the relation between the state and criminality, as well as the ethical and affective dimensions of e each of these entities are rearticulated. I conducted long-term ethnographic research in Mexico City, studying four different objects and the social relations around them. The first of these, is Mexico's Secretariat of Defense's Museum of Drugs, which is not open to the public except for a few journalists and scholars upon written request, and which was created as part of the training for young soldiers. I argue that the restricted and selective publicness of this museum aims to address two main tensions. First, between the official narrative about the military's combat of drug trafficking on one hand, and denunciations of their collusion and extrajudicial violence on the other. And second, between drug trafficking as a set of economic practices and as an affective and cultural force that the military is not equipped to combat. The second are so-called narcoseries, which are televised series that expose the relations of corruption between drug traffickers and high-ranking public officials and often contrast the former's charisma with the latter's lack thereof. These shows rely heavily on journalistic investigation and by mixing fact and fiction, 
They test the limits established by the war's chronic opacity. In some, I argue, they denounce the criminal appropriation of the state, which is a dystopic, a dystopic but highly resonant scenario. The third one consists of mass protests as media forms that center on victims of violence. The latest iteration of these mobilizations, which have been abundant during the drug war, is Mexico's feminist movement, which denounces increasing levels of femicides throughout the country as part of the fallout of the drug war. Galvanized by a case of police violence against a young woman, protesters condemn and demand justice for the victims of acts committed by both criminals and state officials, highlighting a new defining feature of their violence, its misogyny. The fourth and final one is a spectacle orchestrated by the current administration, President Andres Manuel Lopez Obrador, in which he tries to harness the charisma of drug traffickers in order to advance his populist project. The president seeks to present his regime as a generous bandit that takes from the rich and corrupt and gives back to the poor by auctioning confiscated objects from organized crime and ritually purifying them. As opposed to his predecessors, the current president is aware of the inefficacy of confronting the state and crime as embodiments of good and evil, and thus presents this relation differently. On the one hand, he showcases the state as a Robin Hood figure, and on the other, he accuses former administrations of illegitimate violence. So what can this tell us about people today? I think that media forms about contemporary kinds of warfare like this one and their circulation can first give us clues about whether and how the state succeeds at framing war in ways that resonates with that resonate with citizens' perceptions, evaluations, and feelings. And this has broader effects in terms of political authority. Similarly, they reveal that the state's self-representation can adapt and transform in relation to both competing depictions of it and the feelings and perceptions they express and the communicative power of criminality. This may challenge the way we see the state as an entity that stands above and beyond social life. And finally, I think they illuminate deeper tensions at the heart of a state's relation with its citizens, such as unfulfilled promises of social justice or the state's patriarchal logics, which are brought to the fore at exceptional moments such as this. Thanks for watching. Check out the vlog for more human stories and don't forget to subscribe. Peace and light to you and yours. So I, I you know, I sometimes do this and do that.